are under a lot of time pressure here, but it's to kind of model your pitch over the time constraints. So we will have questions, so please do put those in Slido. I will monitor that um, and I will have a timer here. When your five minutes is up, I will raise my virtual hand uh, so that you can see that your time is up for the speakers. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce the first uh, pitch. So this we have Adrian Ansar. He works in the um, consultancy department with the Institute of, en of Energy Studies and Research in Kenya. His work presently involves energy studies, data analytics, and power system analysis. Adrian is from the summer school onset track. So is Adrian around and ready to share? Yeah, hi, a little bit. I am around. I am around and I'm ready to share. Excellent. I will start the timer when you begin presenting. Um, uh, I please confirm that my screen, uh, you can see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. All right. Yeah, all right. Uh, so a very good uh, morning, I believe, uh, to everyone joining us. I want to thank the previous presenters uh, for the work that they've done and for, for the useful insights. Um, so in the interest of time, I wish to quickly go to uh, present the case that we worked on during the joint summer school. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, an electrification scenario analysis uh, for Kenya uh, using the onset uh, onset tool. Uh, so, just a summary of uh, just a brief outlook of Kenya. So, Kenya has a population of had a population of 47 million as of the 2019 census. Uh, it is ranked as a medium. Uh, uh, developed country um, according to the HDI index. Um, as of 2020, electricity access was at 71%. And um, as of June 2021, there were about 8.4 million uh, electricity uh, customers. In, in, in terms of installed capacity, uh, uh, the installed capacity stood at approximately 3,000 megawatts uh, as of June 2021. And by this year, we have crossed the 3,000 megawatt mark uh, in terms of installed capacity. And another important thing to note is that owing to the abundance of renewable energy resources in the country, our generation mix, in our generation mix, renewable energy accounts for an average of 93% of the daily dispatch, which is an incredible achievement. Now you will notice on the map on the right, that the grid appears to be dominant. So the map on the right just shows distribution of transformers and the medium voltage lines. The grid is dominant in the southern parts of the country. That's the main takeaway. But the northern parts of the country have sparse distribution of uh, service transformers and medium voltage lines. And that's because a lot of those areas do not have access to electricity, uh, uh, but also a few are served by mini grids. So that means there's still some work to be done uh, particularly through the planning process to ensure universal access. And that was one of the main scope of uh, the modeling uh, that is in line with SDG 7 to seek to attain affordable, reliable, and sustainable in, uh, universal electrification. And then to define a roadmap for reaching 100% access by 2030. And then an interesting output of, of the onset model is to identify the role of different power technologies in achieving those targets. Uh, by looking at the share of new connections, the uh, uh, final capacity at the end of the planning period, and the required uh, investment. So in this modeling approach, uh, we use the onset tool uh, uh, developed by KTH and the World Bank. And there were two main uh, data sources that we used. One was Energy Data Info, uh, which has public available database, uh, database uh, data sets for many countries. And we also, as part of the scenarios we were running, we included new data uh, from Kenya Power, which is Kenya's uh, sole uh, electricity distributor. And so from that, we ran six electrification scenarios. Uh, the first scenario 
compared the use of old data from the inner data info database with up-to-date transformer data from 2021. So uh, to see how that affects the analysis uh, in comparison to the results previously uh, obtained in the GEP in 2017. And then we also explored the use of different demand uh, targets uh, uh, and seeing how that affects results. And then finally explored the impact of policy decisions that would affect grid cost uh, that introduced mini grid subsidies and the consideration of diesel and how that would affect the total electrification mix. And so we developed six scenarios. In the interest of time, I'm just going to quickly skip over the scenarios. So the first pair of scenarios is simply a comparison of data, uh, but we used uh, uh, we used uh, an approach of, of, of uh, target, targeting demand by assigning a specific uh, tier level uh, according to the World Bank multi-tier framework for urban and rural populations. And the second pair of scenarios introduced a different uh, demand uh, target demand target approach where we considered uh, bottom up demand and again compared that using old transformer data and new transformer data and then the final two scenarios we introduced uh, three more variables uh, the fifth scenario for example we increased grid cost by 30 percent the grid generation cost by 30 percent to account for the expected increase owing to new uh, uh, generation expansion projects. And then also looked at a scenario where mini grid costs get subsidized by 40%. And then finally, we also accounted for productive users of electricity, in able to see uh, if, if we have grid costs increasing, we have mini grids subsidized, uh, and then we put in productive users of uh, electricity, how that would affect the energy model. So in terms of the outcomes, you can see the map on the left um, is an analysis of current electrification uh, uh, and also the uh, sorry it's a presentation of the results of, of the modeling using previous transformer data and on the right using current transformer data you can see there is a very very big difference in terms of the model uh, uh, what the model recommends as the best electrification uh, mix for achieving energy, universal energy access. So EJ, more transformers- we're at time, can you close? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and then uh, the other outcome, so the first outcome is that uh, when we used new data, basically we got a very different result in the model in terms of the electrification mix. And the other in, in important output of this analysis is that when you consider productive users, and when you consider high grid cost and low mini grid uh, uh, and, and uh, mini grid subsidies, you end up with a more diverse mix of electrification options uh, from the model. So just finally, for quick conclusion, what we concluded is that the data quality is very important. There needs to be a single point of truth for data and parameters for not only Kenya, but other countries so that the models can become more robust. And then the reality is that a model like Onset can do a piece screening and identify parameters that need to be improved, uh, which is a very good starting point for collaborators. And then the training on how to do this modeling needs to be continuous and have different levels of expertise and have a wider reach of experts so as to be able to uh, have a stronger impact on policy. And then uh, lastly, uh, the reality is that some of the model aspects of the model can be improved. Uh, in order to better accommodate policy issues. Like, for example, how do we incorporate subsidies, use of hybrid systems, and reliability of supply uh, from the grid? Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Great. Um, so we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yes, I see some hand clapping. Well done. Um, so, Christina, do you have a... <laughs> thank you. Christina, do you have a question that you would like to ask? Um, it's open. I see you have a hand up, Christina. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask if you have a question. Hi, Beth. Um, yeah, sorry. So I mistakenly clicked on the, on the okay. hand. So if anyone else has a question, please. Just go okay. 
Yes, so I don't see anything on Slido, but I did have a question, Adrian, for you. Um, you you touched on this at the end, actually, but while I was thinking, you know, this 2030 for Kenya, 100% um, electrification, does there have any qualifications on quality of that power? And, you know, would it be, okay, you're connected to the grid, but you have two hours of access. Is, is that being built into the model or discussed at all? Do you have any insights there? Thanks. Um, so, uh, in terms of power reliability, uh, of course, we do know that the multi-tier framework uh, does account, the multi-tier framework in detail does account for uh, uh, reliability uh, as well uh, because just plain old access is not enough but for the context of this model uh, we were looking mostly at uh, 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 at the best mix of uh, the best approach to electrify settlements so uh, modeling reliability uh, is not within the scope of this model at this time but however it would be important to come up with the indices that can be included to the model uh, to make the demand uh, for the, the demand consideration aspects more robust to account for reliability as well. But at the moment, it was not within the scope. Okay, thank you. Was there any more questions? Otherwise, we probably need to move on to the next speaker. I don't see any in the crowd either. Okay, thank you very much, Adrian, for sharing your results. Um, and I look forward to seeing more in the future. Um, the, Thank you. the next the next speaker is Kumbuso uh, Nayoni. Are you here and ready to share a screen? While you're pulling up, I would like to give you an introduction. So Kumbuso is currently doing his second master's in carbon management at the University of Edinburgh. He also has a role as a planning engineer, working on grid integration of variable renewable energy sources for the entire electrical grid. Kumbuso is from the Summer School Osmosis and Flex Tool Track, so we'll be seeing those results. Over to you, Kumbuso. I will be timing you. When I raise my hand, you're out of time. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. I think I can start now. All right, uh, three years ago, I think we experienced a drought due to climate-induced lower water levels in the hydro reservoirs. So we had a deficit of about 800 megawatts. Uh, then recently, uh, our 105 heavy fuel power plant is inactive owing to refurbishment needs and also high cost of import fuel. Then to compound the problem, we experienced uh, low electricity access rates, an average of about 31%. Then uh, we lack capacity to manage and collect data. So that poses a problem with regards to modeling or having any data insights. Uh, okay, so the research question is pretty much to see if the business as usual approach is, can actually lead to a sustainable and pragmatic future. Uh, last month, Zambia completed the integrated resource plan, which proposed uh, capacity expansions going forward. So this also, this research also looks at those proposed expansions with regards to uh, carbon uh, emission abatement, uh, cost reflectivity, and also flexibility. Then also exploring the prospects of net zero by 2063 to align with Agenda 2063 for Africa. This is a reference energy system for Zambia. We've got 80% hydro, then the 16% is made up of solar and fossil fuels. Okay, so these are the three scenarios under consideration. We've got the business as usual. That just looks at utilization of cheap resources at any means necessary without any uh, climate resilient targets or low emission targets. Then we've got the IRP, which uh, proposed a mix of hydro, coal, biomass, geothermal, solar, and wind. Then we've got the net zero uh, future which looks at a gradual decline of fossil fuels starting next year, also a gradual increase of renewable capacity comments in next year as well. Okay, so this is a snapshot of some of the results. Uh, in 2030, as can be seen, uh, all the three scenarios uh, give a realistic and pragmatic and sustainable future, as can be seen. There is even excess generation, which can actually go towards exports. However, the situation changes in 2050. We've got the business as usual scenario, which tends to go to unsustainable levels, owing to it being more predominantly biomass. Uh, 
the net zero gives a good mix of uh, generation, while the IRP will require imports to actually meet the demand. In 2063, the problem is compounded for the business as usual. As can be seen, there's more biomass, making it even more unsustainable, while the IRP and net zero will actually re rely on uh, imports to actually meet the demand. Okay, so this shows the annual emissions for the three scenarios. As can be seen, the red tends to a high emission pathway, while the green tends to a uh, net zero in 2063. Okay, so this looks at the snapshot of the flexibility of the existing power system. On the left, you can see in purple, we've got node C, and in light gray, we've got node A, which experienced load shedding, while at least we've got node D experiencing curtailment. So the, the first test of flexibility investment was to link node D and node C. So on the right, under load shedding, as can be seen, the load shedding reduces, but that's not still sufficient to actually eliminate it completely. The next phase was generation investment at node A and C. As can be seen by the bottom right, we actually reduced load shedding altogether in the uh, existing system. Therefore, uh, flexibility in the existing system can actually be enhanced through capacity expansion, both at transmission and generation. The business as usual is not sustainable owing to it being leading to a high emission future. It's possible to actually, uh, it's possible to actually attain the RRP targets, but this will require capacity investment from independent power producers and government. And the cost of generating electricity will range between 11.6 to about $15.6 per megawatt hour. Net zero future is also attainable, but it won't come cheap. And uh, we need to advocate for sustainable and current energy policies to attain both the net zero and the RRP. Investment plans must start now for us to envision a sustainable future that, is, that uh, rides on social inclusion and uh, a low emission pathway. Future work includes continuous model updates to align with technology learning rates and also update the flexibility assessment. The data that I used was based on literature so I think I embark on going to actual generation stations to get actual real data to actually improve the flexibility assessment. Then I would also intend to incorporate sector coupling to, uh, to align with uh, electric mobility, because with the happenings in uh, Ukraine and Russia, the cost of importing has actually trickled down to a common man, and the cost of living has actually skyrocketed, just to explore prospects of us introducing electric mobility in the mix. Then I also did flexibility for these other scenarios, uh, and it actually uh, introduced flexibility issues. So the next step would also to improve flexibility issues for the IRP and the net zero. Then before I close, I would love to thank the trainers for this track. I think they were really helpful. And I would also thank to thank the funders, Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, for this uh, innovative venture. It's actually helping develop a generation of thinkers in that we'll be uh, proposing uh, forward thinking and sustainable policies and aligning the technical with uh, pragmatic policy insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a very excellent talk and quite concise. Well done for covering all of that. Um, I'm going to Thank ask you. the first question, um, if I may, and if anyone has any further questions, do add to Slido. Um, I actually have a couple, but uh, I was wondering, so you mentioned this net, net zero uh, strategy or, or scenario. How far away is there any information or data um, on how far away Zambia currently is to net zero? Um, what kind of emissions, given, given that there's, you know, only 10% fossil fuel usage in the current country? Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Beth. Uh, I think at present, uh, if you look at the electricity access rates, it only stands about 31%. Uh, so as of last month, the integrated resource plan also looks at the practicality of us not really being able to attain net zero by 2050. So it actually proposed the mix of coal as well in the mix. So uh, net zero for us to be pragmatic and to ensure that we've, we're attaining a just energy transition is not something that can be attainable in 2050 because we need to actually incorporate, try to strike a balance. And as much as we can replug by using clean technologies, we also need to ensure that uh, we are pragmatic in ensuring that uh, we extend it to align with 2063 agenda and ensuring that all our citizenry have a sustainable and all-inclusive future 
in, the, in that regard. Because at present, the other compounding issue is the energy needs in the rural space is pretty much uh, biomass. We've got massive charcoal production and also wood fuel, owing to low electricity levels. So for us to actually sus attain sustainable development effects, uh, it's only pragmatic that net zero is extended beyond 2050. And there's actually an adoption of slightly manageable uh, core levels. Hopefully by then we'll be sure that uh, we, we were able to actually introduce technology events that are able to clean the output from the coal power plants, carbon sequestration to that regard. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think that's a good plan. Thank you. Uh, can I ask another question since I don't see any just yet? There is somebody. Uh, yes, here's one. Uh, Kumbuso, uh, how did you forecast future demand? Does it account for increasing accessibility too? Okay, there are, there are two options here. I think, let me let me do this. Let me stop sharing my screen. Let me share my screen once again, just to compound, just to answer that question in a better way. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? No, we just, no. You can't see my screen? I've shared something showing the demand forecast. Okay, there it is, yep. All right, so this is the demand forecast that was co recently concluded in about maybe a month ago. Uh, but in the model, this looks at uh, the electricity demand as for the entire IRP forecast. But I, this is something that I would also want to test. What I used in the demand forecast is the demand as projected by the sand starter kit. So I'll need to also utilize this demand forecast just for certain how our future will evolve even as we try to envision uh, prospects of um, uh, electric mobility. So as, as can be seen, our future is pretty much a net, net exporter. We don't want to rely on importing energy in that regard. So we want to be independent to the point that we can actually anchor our neighboring countries as well. So at present, I would want to extend the study further to see if I incorporate this demand, how is the outlook? If I include immobility and other prospects of regards to sector coupling, how is the outlook with regards to RP demand? So the plan is I'll be updating this demand forecast on an annual basis just to ensure that it remains within pragmatic terms based on what the country envisions to attain going forward. Thank you. Thank That's you very, very comprehensive. Thank you very much, Kambusu. Uh We'll move on to the next speaker, but thank you for that. Um, I believe we're going to pass, Adi might come back, we'll, we're going to come back to you if you're on the call, just in case, um, to Damar and Ignatius. Um, so if you are here, can you just say hi and pull up your stuff while I give an introduction? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. I'm here. Uh, wait okay. a second. Uh, maybe right. I want to share my screen. I'm going to give you an introduction while you share screen. So. Um, Damar's current role involves providing technical assistance and regulatory support services to government and utility in decarbonizing electricity sector in Indonesia. Ignatius works as an energy policy specialist in one of the developing projects under USAID in Indonesia. Damar and Ignatius are from the summer school fin plan track. So over to you both. Thank you. Okay, uh, can you see my screen now? That's looking, it's a. It's not full screen for me, but maybe it's just me. Um, I do see that it's up. Okay, um, so uh, actually uh, I think Damar uh, can be here right now. Maybe I just uh, continue with the presentation. Okay. Okay, so um, Thank you and hi, uh, good morning and afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to present uh, on-grid solar farm uh, project assessment for rural area in Indonesia. So uh, this is the context challenges and resource questions. Uh, as you can see in the map, uh, Indonesia has abundance of solar energy scattered uh, through the islands with four to five kilowatt hour per meter square. As you can see uh, in the legend below, but at the same time, there are still uh, many people in rural areas are still relying on a temporary uh, system uh, to light their home. 
So uh, we find uh, this is uh, pretty interesting and uh, we want to know how to build a potential and stable system of solar farm and how to sell the electricity to this non-commercial and subsidized area. Uh, yeah, as you can see uh, in the red box there, and this is the, the larger version uh, of the picture. So, oh, sorry. So there are two, uh, two resource questions here. And the first one is the project uh, is the project visible enough to be de deployed in rural areas? And the second one, how much subsidy should be prepared for the developer? Um, Ignatius, sorry, oh, yeah. but could you um, share your screen with full screen? Because we are only seeing a part of your screen. Oh, seriously, sorry. It's a, it is very strange. Um, because I already put it on full widescreen screen. screen mode. Yeah, it's not in widescreen mode. It's like in um, a narrower mode. If you just uh, retry again, mm -hmm. sorry, I'm going to pause so it doesn't take your time. Uh, can you see a full my full screen now? It's loading it. I don't see anything yet. OK. Let me try to reshare the screen. Yeah, I think. OK, it wasn't just mine because sometimes mine doesn't show up. At all. OK, that that it now? might be best. It might be best if you're not in presentation mode. I think there might be a setting. Maybe if you move out of presentation mode, it'll be slightly smaller, but at least we can see the full slide. Oh, I'm sorry for yeah. this. <laughs> no, it's OK. Just if you exit presentation mode, I think it'll be fine. OK. How yeah, about now, now we can see it. Yeah, we can see all of it at least. It's very small, so you'll have to provide some more detail, but um, yeah, we can at least see the full screen. Okay. okay. Uh, should I continue now? Yes, yes, sorry. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, let me continue. Uh, as you can see here, uh, here are the parameter uh, of our project. Some important points to know. Uh, are we have a five megawatt peak uh, plan that can generate around 8,300 megawatt hour per year. And then the construction period is two years and the plan life is around uh, 35 years. Then the first operation year would be to, uh, 2024. And we can also see here uh, some economic and financial uh, parameters. However, uh, we have additional info uh, here, uh, as the PPA is agreed uh, to around uh, 1,068.15 uh, rupiah per kilowatt hour. However, uh, we also have some com condition uh, as we want to deploy this technology to rural areas. Uh, there are rural people are only able to afford the electricity tariff at around 450 uh, rupiah kilo per kilowatt hour. So later we create this into our uh, scenarios. So uh, for a fast review, uh, as we can see, the investment is around four, uh, 4 million US dollar and the capex is around 150 million uh, rupiah. We also have uh, some brief uh, market data here. And then, uh, so here's the scenario. Uh, the BAU uh, is the ideal scenario to follow uh, the existing uh, government regulation. So besides tariff, uh, we add uh, some assumption here. We add additional equity of uh, 5,000 uh, uh, million uh, rupiah in 2035 to balance our sheet. And uh, the sub-scenario uh, does have a lower electricity tariff. And uh, we spread the additional equities from 2035 to uh, 2038 as seen in the table. So we did the we did this as well to balance our uh, sheet. And then this is the result. Uh, as we run the model with FinPlan, uh, we can see that uh, the dividend payout of the BAU uh, scenario is faster than a sub scenario, meaning that it's more attra uh, attractive investment. So we can also see that the IIR and NPV of a BAU scenario is greater uh, than sub scenario. So next, uh, according to previous results, we can also see the loans uh, are paid back in time uh, here. Uh, and then, however, uh, there's uh, quite a risk if we can see the debt 
uh, surface coverage ratio in sub uh, scenario because um, uh, it's it's lower than one. So that's it. Uh, I think uh, here are some key takeaways of, of our assessment. So there are two scenarios going on. The bow scenario uh, shows how dividend payout is given right after the project started, uh, while the sub scenario comes after the 10 years of operation. And both scenarios have an acceptable uh, debt equity ratio is 70-30 during the construction phase with a positive NPV and acceptable IRR. Uh, what we can take from two scenarios, uh, this gives a signal that uh, the government should improve its subsidy regulation on electricity tariff for rural area. And the government should offer the price gap subsidies between the desired tariff which is the willingness to pay of a rural area based on the regional survey and the regulated tariff itself, uh, which is uh, 618.15 uh, uh, rupiah per kilowatt hour. Uh, although the sub uh, scenario has a positive uh, NPV, the lower IRR and 10 years dividend payout would make the investment less attractive. And if there are no subsidies, the sub scenarios doesn't create a sufficient uh, enabling environment for private sector uh, investment. So we also identify the future works here. Uh, the scenario could be improved with if we adjust the debt and equity repetitively to have a balanced short term deposits and standby facility and a further existing regulate uh, regulation uh, analysis are needed uh, to make the rural projects become more feasible. I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nassius. Um Great, great presentation. Um, we have time for maybe a couple questions. Uh, my first one to you would be uh, around your future work, because I feel like these scenarios, th there's there's opportunity to develop different scenarios. And I was what, particularly around the investment in debt, debt to equity. Um, what are those? What do you think would be more feasible based off of these results that you've gotten thus far? Do you have any plans for that yet or thought about uh, that? Uh, do you mean like uh, another scenario that we can work on later? Yes, that might that might be more attractive in general. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe um, first because uh, we we working uh, we focus working on the only debt and uh, equity percentage here. Maybe uh, the other sec uh, the another uh, consideration is we can adjust the for example like the inflation rate for example. So if we um, put higher uh, inflation rate on uh, the local currency, which is the uh, IDR, maybe it will affect uh, the, the tariff as well. And then uh, maybe we can also adjust from the investment uh, or maybe uh, the, op um, the construction time because in here uh, we adjust into two years, right? Maybe we can, uh, long uh, expand it into maybe like five years or three years because of the uh, difficulty to the uh, difficulty to the road access uh, to the uh, area so maybe it will affect the investment and then the operation and maintenance as well and uh, the inflation also uh, can be uh, a significant uh, parameters uh, on it yeah yeah, that's a, those are nice ideas. Now, has there been any studies on rural area demands and what might be expected from from those regions? Uh, yeah. So about the demand, uh, we as uh, we can see, uh, maybe I shall turn it the slides. Yeah, we so we create some kind of uh, imaginative market data here. It's a household and business and uh, the farmers irrigation. So yeah, actually they uh, they don't use uh, the full five me uh, five megawatt peak uh, energy consumption, but but it's relatively to four point five uh, megawatt peak. Uh, but the average income uh, of the demand also low, but they have uh, a higher uh, energy energy consumption rate at the time. And yeah, it's 
uh, it's just the household business and farmers irrigation around the uh, area because it's it's uh, a, a rural and it's yeah. maybe partly remote. Yeah, so it's just okay. small. Yeah. Mm. Sure, makes sense. Um, what one more question um, okay. on side of are the suggested rural tariff subsidies realistic? Do you know about equivalent subsidies in other countries? Um, yeah, about that, um, maybe we don't compare uh, to the subsidies uh, to the other countries, but um, yeah, we just compare it uh, right now with the reference uh, of our countries. So actually, uh, we have uh, the subsidized uh, tariff right now, but it's more um, it's more uh, applied to the 900 watt uh, energy usage, uh, but it's still relatively still expensive. And then um, in here, uh, the, the scenario in here, uh, we want to really um, lower uh, the price and see uh, the, the desired tariff from the survey, as I mentioned before. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Um, Thank I think you. That's what we have for now. Yes. Well done, and I look forward to seeing more in the future. Um, we're going to move now over to uh, another group. So Sonia, Raul, and Mtidos, are you online and ready yes, to present? Okay, yes, great. Yes, I am online. All right. I'm going to provide an introduction while you get set up, if that's all right. Um, so Sonia is currently doing her PhD project about multi-scale modeling of the industry sector in Politecnico di Torino, Italy. So Sonia is from the school summer school Muse track, and we okay. can see your non-presentation. There, there it is. All right. Okay. Thank Perfect. You. Thank you very much for the presentation. Our case study um, is about the decarbonization of the primary steel in Italy. That is a very special case because the production is concentrated uh, in one big single plant with a capacity of uh, uh, 12 um, million tons of steel uh, per year. Um, uh, using the business as usual technology, that is the blast furnace technology. That is a great, a great interest in the conversion of this area because of the massive uh, environmental and health impacts that we had in the last 10 years. And the future possible use of hydrogen in the process can also create possible symbiosis with transport sector. In fact, the industry could provide hydrogen produced on site at lower prices, accelerating the penetration of hydrogen in transport sector. The added value of this work uh, is represented by the real industrial input data that we use, especially for the energy prices. In this slide, we can see uh, the reference um, system of the model. Uh, we model uh, explicitly the steel production um, with different options that are basically the uh, blast furnace, uh, the direct reduction with natural gas uh, and the uh, um, carbon capture uh, storage uh, options. And finally, of course, the hydrogen technology. Uh, there are basically two scenarios. The first one uh, um, is a business as usual scenario with economic data and projections that we uh, pro provided from international agencies uh, like JRC and the International Energy Agency. And we model also a post-war uh, fuel prices scenario and um, a lower hydrogen cost scenario in order to accelerate the penetration of this technology. Uh, from 2020 to uh, 2030, uh, the, the blast furnace technology uh, basically um, uh, show uh, the, this scenario shows the dismissing of the blast furnace uh, technology from 2020 to 2030, and the only technology that uh, is able to penetrate the market is the direct reduction. While the CCS technology will not penetrate it, even if we neglected the cost of transport uh, of the CO2 to geological sites, uh, in this case, the, the scenario uh, will be even worse. Um, the hydrogen technology does not penetrate, even if the price of the hydrogen has been set at the target value of $1.5 per kilo. 
With the other two scenario, we discovered that uh, in order to see the penetration of hydrogen before 2050, we need to set the price of hydrogen to $1.5 dollars per kilo from 2030. And this is possible only with subsidies like the European Innovation Fund. Uh, mm, but if you use post-war fuel and electricity prices, we can reach the penetration between 2030 and 2045, depending on the cost of hydrogen. Uh, we don't explicitly, we didn't explicitly model the uh, the transport sector because we have um, uh, no such amount of time. But uh, we make some uh, um, some interesting uh, um, comparison with the cost. In fact, if, if you compare the result to, uh, we obtained from industry with the total the today fuel prices for transport, we discovered that hydrogen can be competitive from four euro per kilo in the worst case to around fourteen euro per kilo in the best case. So for 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 us, it's very important to develop business model for integrated industry city cluster to share the cost of hydrogen between different sectors. In this case, we, uh, we analyze the transport sector, but also for the residential, there are some options. So finally, to conclude, um, ah, just uh, um, just uh, um, a comments about India because we, we we compare also the the price with the transport sector in India. <laughs> and even if in India the, the prices of the fuels are um, even lower with respect to Europe, uh, for transport sector uh, hydrogen could be competitive from four to eight euros per kilo. So there are room for uh, for act also in uh, developing country or uh, uh, country like India. So the results, uh, concluding, we can say that uh, in some specific area, the target value of the cost of hydrogen are not sufficient to a faster, fast penetration of, of this vector. Uh, then we can say that uh, uh, with post-war fuel prices, the penetration of hydrogen in industry could appear uh, before. And then the most important uh, outcome is that transport sector can offer opportunities to develop business model to share the cost of hydrogen production. In any case, uh, subsidies like the European U uh, Innovation Fund, the Guarantee of Origin, uh, uh, the CIC, that is a particular subsidy that we have in Italy for uh, green, uh, green gases, uh, are fundamental. fundamental. Finally, Finally uh, uh, the possible works uh, are uh, uh, the introduction, introduction uh, explicitly uh, someone, someone of the transport can... sector. Yes, there are some echo. Some echo all of a sudden. Can someone okay. Okay, I think so, it's better. Yeah, 22nd final, the possible uh, future works are the introduction of the transport sector explicitly and also the power sector for the on-site generation, the introduction of the uh, of other technologies for uh, still decarbonization, like the uh, blending of natural gas and hydrogen as a retrofit option for the direct reduction of natural gas. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, an improvement of the agent's representation uh, for industry to take into account also uh, some environmental based choices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. Um, great presentation. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. So um, I have a question and then I see there's some other questions on Slido, so we'll get to those. I take liberty as chair. <laughs> um, first, I, well, I have two. So, um, Around infrastructure, so you're assuming here hydrogen um, development, but is this to replace the current pipelines, to go into the current pipelines as a transition fuel, or you know, how are you envisioning the infrastructure of this hydrogen? In these models, yes. In this case, in this case, we analyze the on-site hydrogen production. So uh, basically, um, uh, we analyze the prices, uh, uh, the, the hydrogen costs. In the case we have an infrastructure, in that case, uh, uh, the scenario will be uh, worse than this. So uh, basically, uh, it is uh, also one of the outcome of this work is that on-site generation of hydrogen, uh, also for uh, transport and residential, um, could be uh, a better solution in, the, in, in this uh, in, in in the framework on the, on the industrial city clusters. So um, this is, I mean, an, advant an advantage, no, uh, in, uh, with respect to scenario in which the, there are the infrastructure of hydrogen, in which sometimes uh, there we have no su such uh, room for uh, for uh, I mean uh, for uh, work to the to, to the cost of hydrogen. 
because the, the cost for, for example, for pipelines is like uh, uh, two, two euros uh, more or, or even more, depending on the on the on the area. OK, OK, very interesting. Um, another question here says, thanks, Sonia. How can you translate the results in terms of policy insights for Europe? What additional challenges would you have for developing countries? So it's kind of a two. Yes, uh, for me, the most important challenge is to extend the uh, actual uh, um, energy community uh, reform uh, um, uh, to industry. So for now, the the, um, the legislation is uh, more about uh, the city, the on-site generation for the city. But there are some limitations for industry. In my vision, uh, we, we need to consider energy community as uh, with with industry inside. So this is for me the most important uh, um, insight because uh, if we are not able to uh, share the cost of these new technologies and find uh, some uh, new business model. Okay, there are we need subsidies, but on the other side, we, we need to limit the, the subsidy with smart uh, uh, business model. So this is my answer. Great. Uh, one more question from me. Um, when you say transport sector, what are you actually? What do you actually mean here in the transport? Yeah, we. Yeah, I forgot to, to mention in the presentation, but we analyze uh, um, um, uh, the transport sector, the, the public transport sector, because. Uh, of course, uh, in in the in the future works, we we include also the residential and the private cars, but we need uh, some a lot of uh, um, expectation in trans in public transport sectors because uh, in in the as we see in the slide uh, for the electric uh, the competition is uh, um, I mean uh, more difficult now because the okay uh, there are also room for uh, for uh, for hydrogen there are some competitions uh, with hydrogen. But uh, um, in the private sector, in the private car, is more difficult. So I see it is an opportunity, uh, most of all, for transport sector, public. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for that. We're going to move you. on. Yep. Uh, so over to Jian Vu now. Um, Jian, are you around and ready to present? Can you hear me? Great. OK, um, I'm going to introduce you as you get your slides ready. Um, okay. So Jen is an associate officer at Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Department in Indonesia. Her work involves projects and publications related to providing an outlook for regional energy development in the long run, such as ASEAN Energy Outlook 6, or proposing roadmaps for the potential growth of renewable energy in ASEAN. Jen is from MAED and EBS track. So Jen, over to you. Um, we can see your presentation in not, but not in presentation mode. Okay. Yeah, that's looking that's looking good. Over to you. Can you see it now? Yes, you're a bit quiet. I don't know if you can um, increase your mic. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, that sounds great. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the introductions. Um, my name uh, is Zhang, and today I'm I'm very honored to be here to present about my uh, case study on the energy balance of Vietnam. Um, I uh, from that is the like the deliverables from my uh, MAED and EBS track. So without further ado, I would like to continue to the first part. Um, so uh, to the, um, talk about the table of content, uh, first I'm going to introduce uh, the some uh, bit aspect of Vietnam energy landscape. And then I would uh, raise some problem statement in the case study. Um, next, uh, I will present some results and uh, give some remarks related to the results. And finally, conclusions and future work will, will be presented in the last part. Uh, so about the uh, energy of uh, Vietnam energy landscape, um, I have several like that data related to um, the total energy supply in Vietnam from 1990 to 2018 from International Energy Agency. As you can see that in the total energy supply, um, coal and uh, oil plays a major role in the in the energy mix. 
Um, and um, hydro and biofuel and waste uh, are the, the following. Um, and um, we can see we can see that uh, these are all the non-renewable uh, energy source. Uh, so um, since uh, 2016, uh, realizing that uh, the changes toward energy transitions is necessary, the Vietnamese government has decided to focusing on uh, developing renewable energies. So in particular uh, is the solar and wind energy. So since uh, 2016, uh, these two uh, energy sources has been developed uh, significantly. Um, and uh, the results uh, can be shown in the installed capacity uh, in the power sectors in 2019 and 2020. 20, uh, 20. As you can see on the right hand side. So right here we can see that although the uh, coal fire and uh, hydropower still and uh, still play the dominant dominant role in the total install capacity, but uh, we have see uh, we have seen like some changes uh, related to uh, the new renewable energy representations in the total install capacity in Vietnam. So like in uh, 2019, we can see that the total amount of wind, solar, and rooftop solar is around um, 9 to 10 percent but from but in 2022 uh, this has increased to like um, 20 about 24 percent so it's just shown that uh, Vietnam is the leading country in the Southeast Asia in renewable energy but still um, we still uh, rely a lot on the non-renewables uh, like coal or oil so that is the uh, uh, Vietnam energy landscape I want to give you. So given that context um, about my case study, I'm I'm going to I'm I have used uh, the energy balance studio uh, to construct an energy balance based on national statistic. So um, the objective of me doing this case study is to identify the inflow and outflow of different energy sources in different states uh, in Vietnam. And uh, from that uh, energy balance, I, I, I expect to um, re reduce some insights uh, from, the en for, from the energy situations in my country. So about the data source, uh, I gather some data from Vietnam energy statistic uh, as of 2016. Uh, apologies for not having the more updated data set, but I, I think um, the results can still portray some key insights uh, related to energy sector in Vietnam. Um, that is uh, my problem statement and case study. Um, next, I will provide uh, some results that I have had by using the EBS. So uh, looking at the, the energy balance, I can we can see that um, uh, as I mentioned in the like I mentioned in the introduction part, um, the coal and oil uh, are, are the primary source, dom are the dominant energy sources. We can see that the numbers uh, in k uh, kilotons of oil equivalent is highest in coal and next in primary oil and next in biofuel and waste. And uh, based on the uh, result data I gather and also the result of the ba energy balance, uh, we can see that uh, related to oil product, uh, Vietnam is the, the, the importer of oil products such as the liquefied petroleum gases or motor gasoline. But, uh, but uh, Vietnam is also the exporter of primary oil, meaning uh, we export uh, the crude oil, natural gas liquid and other hydrocarbons. Um, another insight um, that more, I one more minute, Jen. Okay. Yes. Okay. And um, and we can see that the primary core resources goes to the manufacturing and construction activities, uh, while um, the trans the oil products uh, are mainly consumed by the transport sector. Other sector like agriculture, uh, forestry, fishing, commerce, uh, and public service and uh, residentials is the main consumer of the electricity. Um, and uh, another insight that uh, I have deducted in, in the energy balance is that um, 
2016 is like a beginning year of the renew renewable energy development in Vietnam. So most of the data I gather, um, the, the information about the renewable energy source like um, solar or wind energy is quite limited. It's, it's nearly zero. So uh, it has not been uh, shown quite, um, uh, quite significantly in the energy balance. But uh, since uh, 2016, uh, there has been a rate um, increase in the renewable energy. Uh, after doing the case study, I have several conclusions. Uh, first, uh, we can see that uh, the non-renewable energy source uh, still plays a dominant role in the energy demand and supply in Vietnam. Uh, those acknowledging uh, these situations, uh, more initiatives and in incentives to stimulate uh, renewable energy development should be established. And um, furthermore, the diversification of energy sources is necessary because uh, if we uh, only focus on one specific kind of renewable energy source, uh, it will not be possible to in in uh, reducing uh, the non-renewable ones. Uh, next, uh, another uh, very important point that we should consider is that the development of renewable energies and uh, and social economic benefits sh should be harmonized. This can be shown that uh, the government should focus on the universal electrifications, especially in rural area, uh, increasing the use of biomass and bioenergy and for uh, developing more of grid technologies. Uh, about the future work of the, of the case study, I think uh, there are several like witnesses during the time I working on uh, this energy balance. Um, I think uh, it's very uh, it's very challenging for me to define like um, if we could wrap up, wrap up please yep. yes and um, and the data missing matters is also a um, challenges for me when working on this so I so uh, there is a need to uh, have more up to date data and and con and uh, in this study I um, I I don't do not consider other scenarios. I just look into the past results, so I hope that I can combine with others modeling tools to consider other scenarios with simulations. So to come up with not only insights, but also some recommendations for the future. So that is the end of my presentations. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Zen. Um, very well done. Uh, and very comprehensive. I, I know it must be difficult not to have the most up to date data, but um, maybe that's something to to do in the future. Sounds good. Um, we have uh, I'm just going to ask one quick question before we move on. Um, I was wondering around since this is all around about energy balance and it seems that Vietnam is adding a lot more solar. I saw that huge increase in rooftop solar uh, along with the other solar in the last you know two years. How is that, how is, from your perspective, Vietnam dealing with their uh, intermittency? Have they found a good way to balance that out? Um, Any thoughts yes. there? Yes, that's a very great question. Thank you so much for giving me that. Um, uh, the matter of, uh, I think um, one of the main issues of uh, the solar bloom in Vietnam is not only about the intermittencies, but also about the, in the, transmissions and distributions issues. But in order to um, mitigate that uh, the intermittent nature of solar energy, um, I have seen that the governments and also the private sectors has um, made efforts to uh, make research and also implement some projects related to uh, battery storage system uh, and work in earnest to, to like enhance it and apply it in in the actual solar energy projects. Um, and regarding the, as I mentioned above, about the transmission and distribution matters, um, so for now, the government has decided to slow down the development of solar energy and focus more in others, renewable energy source. So um, I think that is also a way to like strike the balance between the uh, energy demand and supply in Vietnam and also solve other related issues in uh, renewable energy source. Uh, yeah, I, I hope I have answers your questions. Uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Yes.
Um, so I believe we're going to have a slight change in uh, the the agenda now. So we will have um, since Adi Chandra is not here, we're going to move back to Kambusu actually, who is going to present a bit about clues. Um, can I hand the floor over? Since we did an introduction for you already, we're just I'm just going to hand over if that's okay. Kambusu, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Are you happy to present? Sure, sure. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is the closed model framework for Zambia that I that I dot in the summer school, uh, building from scratch using uh, Osmosis uh, 2.1 and 3.3. All right. Some of the issues that have been first. Uh, I think there's rampant deforestation in Zambia, um, owing to low electrification rates. We've got uh, charcoal production, wood fuel, just to meet uh, sources of energy and also as uh, livelihoods for people. Then there's poor planning for dwellings. You find that uh, little trains often contaminate the water table in most communities. Uh, then there is unsustainable agricultural practices, which often leads to over-exploitation of land. Then there are all data gaps. You find that there's, there are no relevant data collection projects to ensure that we have got up to date quality data. Neither do we have the right capacity most of the times to ensure that we manage data in a manner that's sufficient. Okay, so my research question was pretty much to see if by Zambia following a business as usual uh, approach, it will lead into a sustainable and pragmatic future with regards to interlinkages between various resources that is from uh, uh, climate, land, energy, and water systems. Then to see if by implementing the current energy strategies, uh, see the impacts that they're resource mix would be impacted for the other sectors, for instance, to see if implementing energy strategies will impact climate, land, water, either in a good way or a negative way. Then also to ascertain the abatement of emissions by implementing these strategies. Then finally, also to see if policy coherency is attainable with a mix of these resources and what measures need to be done going forward to ensure that it's attainable if it's not. Okay, so this is a simplified uh, reference energy system for Zambia. Uh, these are say, sector linkages that were modeled in the close framework for Zambia uh, for all the sectors, including energy, water, climate, and uh, and land. Okay, this is a snapshot of uh, the scenarios. So we've got the business as usual scenario that only looks at utilizing the available cheap resources without factoring in sustainability or any emission reduction uh, pathways. Then we've got what I'm calling the Renewable Energy Strategic Action Plan, uh, which more or less like uh, looks at adoption of uh, renewable energy capacity of about two gigawatts by 2030, yeah, ranging from geothermal, solar, hydro, and wind, and also looks at also constraining fossil fuels to reduce emissions. Then additionally, we've got a biofuel target under the same uh, scenario looks at adoption of uh, 3.7 petajoules of biofuels to replace the cooking energy that is mostly coming from deforestation or into charcoal production and uh, old fuel. Okay, so this is these are the results for the business as usual. As can be seen on the top left, our generation production is pretty much before 2040, it's somewhat sustainable in that we've got more of hydro and a mixture of solar and wind, but beyond 2040, uh, we've got all into the demand increase, coal comes into a mix. Since we're looking at uh, just utilizing available resources, you find that uh, there's actually a steep in increase in coal. On the left, on the right top, you see that emissions also increase after 2040 as can be, to unsustainable levels. Then the bottom left, that's the land area by crops. I think I, I managed to model three crops. That is the, the main top crops, maize, soya beans, and groundnuts. Uh, then on the right bottom, we see the water demand increases to align with also coal production. That is, uh, after 2040, the water production, water demand in the power sector rather increases as well. So now the next question was to see, okay, by implementing the RISAP targets, which looks at adoption of renewable energies and also biofuel to replace charcoal and uh, wood fuel, how will that impact the other sectors? So as can be seen, uh, on the top left, the, we've got a better generation mix following the resub scenario, 
core reduces tremendously. We've got more of hydro, more of solar, and also some geothermal in the mix as well. Uh, on the top right, emissions also decline owing to reduction in core production. Then the bottom graph shows that even the water demand also reduces in the power sector in that we have a reduction in core production. Then what was notable, uh, the impact on the land was not that notable. This shows paves way for an opportunity to actually calibrate the land input parameters. Because we find that with these scenarios, there was not, the land was not, because what I expected to see was that with uh, biofuel, I expected there to be competition with chloroprine, for instance, with regards to the yield, and also just for it to take up more land. But I will need to calibrate the inputs to ensure that uh, the results make uh, pragmatic going forward. Okay, so some policy insights. So the business is uh, unsustainable going forward. So then the risk scenario reduction by 60% in 2063 with reference to the business as usual levels. Uh, meeting the renewable energy strategy action plan target by 2030 reduces the water demand in the power sector owing to a decline in coal generation. Uh, then the general comment is to ensure policy coherence. We need to ensure that various ministries actually work together to align their goals and targets. Because uh, at the end of the day, we want to ensure that we enhance quality of life through clean energy and water provision coupled with sustainable agriculture practices and human settlement. And also ensure that our main focus, as even as we ride on sustainability, is emissions abatement. Uh, future work, I intend to include detailed cost structure of agricultural inputs and implement practical water withdrawal limits. Then I also intend to incorporate climate shocks and also continue updating the cruise model to incorporate more uh, crops and also just uh, land use changes as well. Then I also try to explore the climate resilience of the resource infrastructure using the national infrastructure system model too. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so we have a question, if I may just quickly from Slido. Um, you touched on this, but perhaps you want to elaborate more on your future work. The question is, what would you like to add to your clues model? Are there any other land uses, power plants, or interlinkages you would like to include, and why? So maybe elaborate a bit more on your last points. Okay, thank you very much. I think the most critical part, if you look at the emissions um, uh, trajectory for Zambia, it's pretty much from land use change. So I'd want to ensure that the calibration for land use change is done to, to a pragmatic levels, because that will more or less like impact uh, our future emissions pathway. So I would want to do due diligence in that regard going forward, then ensure that I interlink it with all the other sectors in a manner that actually uh, makes pragmatic sense in the on the ground. So in that regard, I would ensure that there'll be massive stakeholder engagement going forward, because at the end of the day, I think a model that is looked at by several eyes is actually better than me looking at it, because I'll be biased to, with regards to what results I'd want to have. So I would actually extend this module to other stakeholders as well to see what inputs they would, they would want to see going forward, just to align with all the policies across various sectors so that we ensure that even as we adopt policies going forward, coherency is the main focus. That sounds very good. Uh, well done. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, Thank you. We're going to move to the last speaker. Uh, who I believe will be a slightly different format now. Darlene, are you there? Sorry, can you hear me? Ah, yes, good Hi to there. see you. Um, let good me provide an introduction, uh, if that's all right. Um, Darlene works in the Tracking Sustainable Transitions Unit within the Energy Modeling Office Division, which is responsible for, among other things, the agency's flagship publication, The World Energy Outlook, which I believe some people use as data sets. Anyway, uh, he is particularly responsible for capacity building activities with partners on the African continent. Um, so I'm not gonna time you on this one, but over to you, Darlene. Yeah, I'll be quick, I promise. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here speaking after uh, so many interesting and brilliant presentations. Um, so as kindly introduced by Beth, my name is Darlene and I work within the team which is commonly 
uh, referred to as the World Energy Outlook Team here at the International Energy Agency. And what we do is essentially modeling to support uh, decision making. So in particular, I spend most of my time modeling uh, the African energy and power system, along with working on projects we have with partners uh, in particular yeah, across uh, the entire continent. So I will focus my presentation on this specific geographical area for relevance today, and also because it's particularly uh, important, let's say, because there is a lot uh, going on lately. But all these considerations uh, I will be doing also generally apply to the rest of the countries, whether they are OECD members or not, for example. So, uh, brief introduction, as you may know, the IEA is an international intergovernmental agency funded uh, more or less 50 years ago. Uh, to summarize our um, areas of work, first, we work on collecting, treating, and analyzing data from all countries in the world and describing uh, how each uh, energy source is produced, transformed, and consumed uh, sector by sector. Second, we work on advising decision makers to uh, help them develop energy policy. Uh, and then lastly, uh, on concrete implementations, for example, by mean of capacity building and bilater bilateral collaboration programs. So all these efforts are done, um, are directed uh, towards shaping energy systems that uh, are secure, first of all, uh, affordable, sustainable for all, and uh, in the world and uh, also in Africa. So, as I said, um, we work on capacity reinforcement. So, we have trainings on energy statistics and energy efficiency, for instance. So, we worked across the continent with uh, the African Energy okay. Commission. Uh, we trained uh, till more than 500 statisticians, uh, more than 200 uh, policymakers from uh, more than 30 countries uh, across the, the continent. We have uh, institutional engagement going on. Uh, in particular, as I said, we have strategic partnerships with the African Union and the African Energy Commission. Um, I won't spend so much time in the difference between members and associated countries, but um, recently, we had South Africa and Morocco, which uh, joined the uh, associated countries uh, members, so uh, big achievement. And um, we have uh, frequent summits with uh, African and energy leaders. As I said, we work on statistics and modeling, so on data and analysis, and we uh, we work on uh, producing different publications. Uh, as you, you may know, the World Energy Outlook, which is our flagship publication, but then we have uh, specific regional and sector specific publications. Uh, here you have a small collection on the recent, the more, more rec the most recent ones related to Africa and in general um, sustainable development and developing countries. We have the Africa Energy Outlook 2019. Um, which will be updated actually um, next week. We will publish the Africa Energy Outlook 2022. And then you have other uh, regional uh, reports, for example, um, on North Africa. So we are working on the Horn of Africa uh, report. We have African Hydropower. Um, we have the SDG7 tracking report we do with uh, other stakeholders such as the World Bank uh, and uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency. So, uh, with respect to ongoing capacity building programs, we have, uh, I selected um, two projects which I think are relevant for our discussion today and also, again, with the work you have done um, this the past two weeks and brilliantly presented today. So the first is the data for, a full, for an affordable sustainable energy system for Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which is, uh, as you can see, funded by the European Commission. It's a four-year program and we work with 10 Sub-Saharan Africa countries. The objectives are two, uh, to build capacity in energy data and statistics and to build capacity in the use of evidence-based analysis for long-term energy planning using integrated modeling, uh, integrated modeling tools. So really um, linked to what you, you have been working these two weeks and what you presented today. So why 
do uh, energy data and modeling matters, uh, matter? So first of all, we have energy statistics, uh, which are the basis to understand the past and the present. Uh, once this is done, modeling allows us uh, to explore the possible future and develop energy uh, policies in line with um, these objectives. So regarding the second point, I think uh, what was said, for example, in session number three on what policy uh, insights do high level decision makers need. Uh, the talk there perfectly summarized the concept uh, of how modeling is important in identifying uh, possible pathways for the future. And for the energy statistics, uh, so, so since I don't want to spend uh, to, to use much time, much of your time, uh, I also um, suggest you to follow session seven in which um, one of our uh, more brilliant colleagues, which is, which is Roberta Quadrelli, which is head of data and, statistics, data and indicators for energy transitions um, here at the, the IEA, will explain our point of view uh, from statistics perspective. But this dualism between the energy statistics and um, modeling is really a core of uh, our action and also how actually the IEA is structured as, as um, let's say, a, a big task force, but with um, two very, two complementary course, uh, course, which are statistics uh, and modeling. So the second project um, which I would like to present to you is the Data Driven Electrification in, in Africa uh, project, which is funded and implemented with uh, uh, USAID uh, Power Africa. Uh, is uh, a two years program uh, with eight sub-Saharan Afri Africa countries. And here again, we see uh, this dualism between the electricity access, uh, sorry, the statistics and the modeling. So we have a first part, uh, which is the uh, refining and improving electricity access data in sub-Saharan Africa. And for that, at the moment, we are working on a guide uh, to electricity access statistics document, which will, let's say, provide an overview of the methodological differences between uh, the main actors in the sector uh, and comments, uh, for example, uh, did Darlene for free freeze for everyone else? Okay, I see people nodding. <laughs> Uh, Darlene, are you are are you there? Okay. Um, all right. I I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe he'll reconnect in a moment. Um, but I, I think we this this he was the last speaker, which would bring this session to a close. Um, in the meantime. <laughs> Once we can get uh, Darlene back, um, I just wanted to thank all of the people who gave presentations and, you know, everyone else who was part of this program. It's quite exciting and actually really inspiring to see all the different scenarios being drawn up, quite innovative um, scenarios along with the energy transition. So I hope um, you also inspired to continue pushing the different modeling. Um, does anyone have any last minute comments before sorry. we move? Uh, Darlene, are sorry. you here? Yeah, sorry. I don't know what happened with uh, our internet connection. Sorry for that. I can quickly wrap up and... Could you Could just, you please? Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yes. Sorry, I don't want Thanks. to. Okay. So... Uh, is it working? Okay, perfect. Um, so, okay, I will jump to the conclusion. Uh, so just to conclude, I, I wanted just to show you two visualizations from our, our Africa Energy Outlook 2019, uh, because in them you can see uh, the combination of statistics and modeling I was mentioning uh, regarding, for example, the access rate uh, and people without access to electricity in the graphs, um, in this case on the left. Uh, but you can also see 
uh, like first you can see in the first one in the left part, let's say, uh, the scenario approach you also used. Uh, so I invite you to have a look also at our publications. Maybe you already know the differences, for example, from uh, between our step scenario, which is the stated policy scenario, and the NZE, which is the net zero emission by 2050 scenario. So different assumptions and you can see how uh, in this case we have first the historical uh, trends, which are, let's say, the statistics component, and then the future pathways, uh, which are the results of our modeling exercises. On the right, you can see an example, which is, which could also um, result suspiciously, suspiciously uh, familiar, since it's uh, from onset. Uh, we developed also with the ATH, the CCG team, uh, let's say, a customized version of onset that we applied without using our input data, so the IEA data as input uh, and uh, our scenarios and our assumptions in order to do a least cost electrification um, analysis on the entire continent. And this is from 2019. You will see uh, the, the updated version uh, in the Africa Energy Outlook 2022, which will be uh, launched uh, this Monday, actually, in four days, so June 20th. Um, and you can, uh, so I invite you to follow the event, the launch event, which will be uh, here at uh, our headquarters, but which will be openly streamed on our website. This is the link, but you can just type Africa Energy Outlook 2022 on uh, Google and you will uh, definitely find it. So thank you very much for your attention and please, free, please feel free to contact me if you have any further needs or questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jolene. Sorry for the internet connection blip, but um, I guess I guess I have one question about how this energy outlook. Um, how can people implement that within their own modeling? Can they take is that open source data that they can take and then use or and play with or how how is that working? Okay, so um, our outlooks um, are the results of a modeling exercise, let's say, which is uh, done with a, a, a model we own, actually, which is the World Energy Model, which is a super, let's say, complicated and integrated model, which tries to, uh, yeah, to model everything um, within the world energy uh, sector, let's say. Um, so the results are openly available as um, so the input data are openly available because the vast majority of them are the data, as you mentioned, that uh, probably uh, many of the participants uh, to the workshop used. Uh, so they are openly available on our um, on our website. Uh, not all of them, but we are trying to understand, and there is discussion, let's say, at higher level on how to to work toward that direction. Um, so that's that's more or less the idea. The results of the of the modeling uh, are presented in the the outlook. So we try to be um, as much compressive as we can when disclosing those numbers, etc. So many of them are just in the text. Some of them are in appendix so that uh, they can be definitely directly used. And then um, let's say on our website we have dedicated sessions in which we try to talk to take those data. Um, and not just putting them as raw data, but with interactive dashboards, et cetera, so that you can filter also the, the data you want. First plot them also to, to identify maybe the data you, you, you would like to download and then you can directly download them. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, I better stop and close the session. Sorry. <laughs> um, but very interesting stuff. Absolutely. I hope we'll use thank it. Thank you very much. Um, for, um, and and with that, I already thanked everyone, so I'm not going to do it again. Um, but it was awesome. Thanks, everybody. Over to you, Naomi, Carla.